Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to get right back into chapter 22, the great book of Jeremiah. Uh, 22, 1 through 23, about 8, has to do with introducing the branch. And of course, that branch is Christ. And uh, you will have a long list of um, good kings and bad kings in the house of Judah looking forward to the perfect king of Judah, which would be the king of kings and lord of lords. Having said that, uh, chapter 22, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father, let's go with it. Thus saith the Lord, go down to the house of the king of Judah and speak there this word. Now, the king at this time, probably one through about eight here, is Jehoiakim, K-I-M, Jehoiakim. Uh, and um, uh, verse 2, and say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah. I want to correct, yeah, and uh, we'll correct that. Let's see, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, that sitteth upon the throne of David. Thus thou and thy servants and thy people that enter in by these gates. In other words, this would be the word of God talking to these kings. Verse 3, thus saith the Lord, execute ye judgment. You do what's right and righteousness, and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, and do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. Now, this is, this is a wonderful thing that Father instructs, because that's what we're supposed to do even today with the Word of God, is to teach it in such a way that it brings the prisoners of deception, out of deception, into the freedom of knowing God's Word and, and the truth. Uh, and, and, um, and there you have it. Execute means you practice it, you dispense it. You see that what is right goes out to the people. Verse 4, For if you do this thing indeed, then shall there enter in by the gates of this house kings sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, he and his servants and his people. And, and so it is that um, the responsibility of that kingship, if they'll do it, and even to this day, the men will lose out here. The, this particular genealogy that we go from Jehoiakim on down through to the younger brother, Zedekiah, then all of his sons will be killed by the taker of uh, Judah, which is Nebuchadnezzar, and, but the daughters will reign supreme. And the daughters, even to this day, do you, do you know what? The, the one that sits on the throne in Great Britain, even at this time, do you know what the first charge is in commandment? is protector of the faith. That's what the queen is supposed to protect foremost over the nation even, is protector of the faith. And uh, naturally from this, we have, we have, you might say, well, what has that got to do with me? Well, what, what do you think this is? Who, who do you think King James was? That's where these words come from. King, the King James Bible was brought forth so that the English reader could have the word of God even in his own home. Verse 5, But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, saith the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. Uh, it, I'm, I'm going to see that it's ruined. Verse 6, For thus saith the Lord unto the king's house of Judah, 
though thou art Gilad unto me. That's, that's where some of the best balm, healing balm in the world is brought from. He said, that, that, you make me feel good. And the head of Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon are so very protective. Yet surely I will make thee a wilderness and cities which are not inhabited. And so it will be. That's what Father says. Though, though, though I love you and you're the healing balm to my soul, how I created you for my pleasure and the pleasure you give me. And the cedars of Lebanon, you know, if, if you make a, a, a chest out of cedar, you can put woolen clothing or anything else in it and nothing, no insect will bother it. It's safe. Verse 7, And I will prepare destroyers against thee, every one with his weapons, and they shall cut down thy choice cedars and cast them into the fire. They'll cut down the houses that you built out of that fine cedar, the paneling and all, and into the fire it will go. And, and so it is. Who are these destroyers? Well, the head destroyer, that's one of Satan's names. But we have the swarmers, the devourers, and the consumers. Do you think that's any accident? Verse 8. And many nations shall pass by this city, and they shall say, Every man, and this is not Adam, it's Ish, every Ish to his neighbor, Wherefore hath the Lord done thus unto this great city? How did it come to be this way? It will especially be that way when the false one stands in the holy place claiming to be Christ. Verse, the, the head destroyer, verse 9. Then they shall answer because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worshiped other gods and served them, especially the false Messiah in the futurist sense. It's coming, my friend. That's why these things happened as an example whereby you would know in the end times what befalls our people and what consummates the end of this age. See that you're not deceived. You know, God's not angry at those that love him, those that practice uh, and execute judgment and righteousness. That's his promise. He'll protect you. But woe to those that do not. Verse 10, Weep ye not for the dead, neither bemoan him, but weep sore for him that goeth away, for he shall return no more, nor see his native country. Now, this is bringing it down as an example for you to go by. Josiah is the one that is dead. He's the king. This was the subject is go down to the kings. Josiah, the father of these lads, he's dead. He said, don't, don't weep for him. He's in good shape. He cleaned out all the grove worship. He, he threw out all the false teachers. I mean, he was a good king. But he said, but you better weep sore for old Jehoiakim because he's going to go into captivity and he's not coming back again. And that's exactly how it was. Verse 11, listen carefully. For thus saith the Lord touching Shalom. This is Jehoahaz, okay? One of his names, it means retribution. One of the sons. The son of Josiah, king of Judah which reigned instead of Josiah, his father, which went forth out of this place, he shall not return, return thither anymore. He, he, um, Josiah was a good king, and Jehoahaz, bad, bad, bad. Uh, you know, many might say, well, does God hold leaders responsible? Well, what do you think? Joaz was a fantastic leader. And, um, and Josiah, rather, and God loved him. God protected him. And uh, some of his sons, are not, they're going to have a burial like an ass. That is to say, just drug out by the roadside and left for the buzzards. Not even a funeral. So don't, don't think God doesn't pay attention to leadership. Verse 12. But he shall, uh, Jehoiakim, Jehoahaz, 
He shall die in the place whither they have led him captive and shall see this land no more. And, and, uh, and so it is uh, that uh, uh, he, he may run to Egypt. He may run and try to find an ally. But Nebuchadnezzar is going to take him and kill him. Verse 13, Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness. Um, this is Jehoiakim again, okay, the king. And his chambers by wrong that useth his neighbor's services without wages and giveth him not for his works. In other words, a king that is a rip-off artist that pads his own nest, takes advantage of everybody, and never thinks about the people he's supposed to be a, to assist, to be a leader over, to protect, to care for their well-being. He doesn't care. He uses them. You see, God does pay attention to leaders. Verse 14. That saith, I will... Build me a wide house. That's what this fake king will say. I'll build me a wide house and large chambers and cutteth him out windows and it is sealed with cedar. I mean cedar paneling, the most expensive there is, and painted with vermilion. You know, he, he rips the people off and only pads his own nest. Doesn't care about them. Do you think that makes God happy? He'll kill him. He'll drive him away, he'll have his eyes gouged out, and he will never return. God pays attention to leadership. Verse 15, Shalt thou reign because thou closest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice, and then it was well with him? Your father distinguished himself. He... he um, he did not necessarily build all this splendor, but he still had plenty of food and, and, uh, and drink to be satisfied and everything, but um, not with this splendor that you're trying to put up here, taking advantage of the people, letting them do without. 16, he judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well with him was not this to know me, saith the Lord. In other words, was this not to honor me? What are you saying? He did it because God instructed him to. Jo uh, Josiah did it because he loved the people and he loved the Lord. And he served the Lord. This is what separates true servants from those that really take advantage of an office and rip the people off. Verse 17. But thine eyes and thine heart are not but for thy covetousness. <clears throat> you just care about yourself. And for to shed innocent blood, you don't care. And for oppression and for violence to do it. Um, uh, you you um, neither uh, understand God's word, you do not accept it, you do take no responsibility on yourself, and um, you have no heart, is what he's saying. Your eyes and thine heart are not but for thy covetousness. Your heart doesn't know any better. It's not in your mind to be concerned about the people, the poor, the needy. Verse 18, Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, and finally he's named, okay, old Jehoiakim the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, my brother, or oh, sister, they shall not lament for him, saying, Oh, Lord, or oh, his glory. They're not going to have one word of sorrow for him. Well, what does that mean? Well, they're going to be glad to see him gone. Do you think God doesn't care about leadership? Verse 19, we finally have his name brought out, Jehoiakim. 19, he shall be buried with the burial of an ass. 
drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. In other words, um, it's believed that he died on the road to Babel and they just drug him off the side of the road and there he lay. No funeral, no, no um, sense of, um, of, um, of uh, sorrow or, or of honor. Why? Because he was dishonorable. This, you know, kind of looks forward to the time that the destroyers come and the destroyers take over and many people that tried to live a righteous life thinking they were, but rather listening to the traditions of men rather than this word of God to take the warning and, and, and take advantage of it, to be secure, um, misled and worshiping the false one then unfortunately, there will be no Christo, Christian uh, fellowship or worships there. As a matter of fact, there will be many of them after they've even worshiped the Antichrist, when the true Christ returns, they'll run to him and say, oh, Jesus, remember now, in our church, we cast out demons in thy name. And we, he said, you get away from me, I never knew you. Why? Because they were always worshiping the wrong Jesus and they didn't teach the difference. It makes a difference who, who you worship. God is jealous. He wants you to worship Him or the, uh, through the Son that He sent to pay the price that you could have salvation. That's not asking too much. But He gives you an example of what can happen to you along the way. Would you say poor old Jehoiakim? No, He got what He deserved. Verse 20, Go up to Lebanon, and cry, and lift up the voice in Bashan, that bomb's not going to help you, and cry from the passages, for all thy lovers are destroyed. I mean, they are, um, the destroyers have got them, your allies are gone with you, and, um, um, and this is written to Jerusalem, all right? It's, it's just, that's just the way it is. When the false Christ comes, Jesus would just, will cleanse it. 21, I spake unto thee in thy prosperity, but thou saidest, I will not hear. This hath been thy manner from thy youth that thou obeyest not my voice. Now, if you can't determine there that our father is a little put out at him, he expects leadership to be leadership. 22, the wind shall eat up all thy pastors, and thy lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then shalt thou be ashamed and confounded for all thy wickedness. The, the, the east wind is a hot, dry wind, and what it does, it comes in and it kills everything growing in the pasture whereby the pastors have nothing to feed. The analogy is that your, your very leadership has brought people to the point that you don't have anything but a bunch of false teachers. They don't have any food to feed to the people that is from me, the living God. The east wind has destroyed it. I can, I can go a little deeper in that, this east wind comes from where? Across the Euphrates to the east, Kedem in the Hebrew tongue. You better look to the east and see what that east wind is destroying among our people even this day in the future of sins. Verse 23, you don't have any truth to feed the people. That's what he's saying. Uh, you know, if you leave God out of the equation, even whereby your preachers are not teaching God's Word, you've got some people that are in a heap of hurt. Verse 23, O inhabitant of Lebanon, that makest thy nest in the cedars, how gracious shalt thou be when pangs come upon thee, the pain as a woman in travail. When the end of time comes and it's time for the birth of a new age, where are you going to be? Are you going to be in truth or in fiction? 
Has the east, will the east wind that brings the swarmers, the destroyers, the, the devourers, and the consumers taken you? Or are you wise enough to be able to discern the times and obey the commands of the living God in taking forth the food to the children whereby they are fed adequately in the season of that time of the labor pains to know how to protect themselves in the everlasting arms of Almighty God for His protection and His guidance. 24, as I live, saith the Lord, here He's swearing by Himself, though Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee hence. This would be the younger of Jehoiakim's son, it was Jeconiah, his name would be changed too. And, and then what God is saying, Yah means, uh, uh, Jeconiah means whom Yah has uh, appointed. And when, when you, instead of saying Jeconiah, this given name for him, when you pull away the Yah, you're taking, he said, you'd get my name off of him. Don't you call him Yachaniah. You call him Kaniah because I'm not with him. I want nothing to do with him. For he's a, even, even if he were the signet, that, that is the ring on God's hand that puts the living seal on things. I wouldn't use him. 25, and I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life and into the hand of them whose face thou fearest even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, that's Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans, that's the, the Syrics. Uh, I'm going to give you over into them. And, and they did. This was 200 years after the other tribes went into captivity. But, um, and and uh, it would, he would kill all the males in this family line, even, even the final one himself, uh, Zechariah, but God was so upset with this um, Jehoiakim that would be called Jeconiah and then changed to Kaniah, a, a pretty worthless, 26. And I will cast thee out and thy mother that bear thee into another country where ye were not born, and there shall you die. And, and the queen mother did go with him because he was very young at that time. Worthless, but young. 27. But to the land whereunto thou desire to return, thither shall they not return. They're not coming back, and they didn't. Why? They died. Verse 28. If this man, Kaniah, or rather, is this man, Kaniah, a despised, broken idol? Question. Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Question. Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? Uh, that comes, to the kings of Judah come to a pretty miserable end here. The males do. I want to emphasize that again. Verse 29, O earth, 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 three times for emphasis. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to me, he says. <clears throat> That's great emphasis placed on it. 30, thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. And you know, many people think, whoa, wow, that just ended the uh, whole David's seed line, right? Not, did, you, did you not hear what was said? I mean, God said it three times. For, he mentioned earth three times for emphasis. I mean strong emphasis, emphatic. There will be no man from this tribe, that family, 
that will sit on the throne. He didn't say anything about the girls. Okay, It's a big difference. God doesn't shut David off. So it will be the girls that will carry on the lineage from this point. And again, you know what happened as we will find in the remainder of this book of Jeremiah concerning the branch, that Jeremiah will take these daughters that are left of David's seed line, and he will go to Europe with them. He will go first to Egypt, and uh, then later on to Europe. And so it is that the seed continued, and the throne and the stone of destiny on which all the king line has been, the coronation has taken place over is that stone that was carried through the desert, that stone of scone, the stone that Moses struck twice and water came forth from it. How precious is the word of God, the protector of the faith still manages. Uh, chapter 23, verse 1, let's get into it a little bit here. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. You think God, if you think he's hard on the political leaders such as the king line, what do you think he's hard on about the leaders of the churches, his spiritual line? He says, Whoa, I mean, that's, it doesn't get much worse coming out of God's mouth. Whoa. To, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. It is a dangerous thing for people not to teach the word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby the people, pastors of God's house, are teaching God's word, not their own, not some pamphlet, not some ritual, but carrying forth the very word of God itself to a flock that is starving for truth. The east wind burning up the pasture thereof leaving little tidbits, but those tidbits are powerful and wonderful when you know the real truth and stay within it rather than the traditions of men. Verse 3, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. If you don't understand that, you, you have a problem. There, is, there has always been a remnant. And that remnant has always been utilized to bring forth the real, true word of God. You can read of that remnant, remnant in Romans chapter 11, where God would quote... Um, um, 7,000 that haven't bowed a knee to Baal that Elijah would cry about. And then God would say, there has always been a remnant, but the rest I sent the spirit of slumber that is stupor in the Greek. I sent the spirit of stupor. And that remnant is God's elect down through the years. The main elect live at the last generation, but there has always been that remnant that sticks to the Word of God, not the traditions of men, not, not some uh, doctrine of, uh, of a group, but the very Word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And through this and in doing this, that remnant from, from uh, Paul would have been a part of that remnant, the remnant br that brought forth the true word all the way down through the years, if you listen to it. It's, it's very special. They have a purpose, and it is to bring that word forward undented, un, un, um, dis molested by idol worship of any kind and brought forth simply to worship the living God who delivered the message to the remnant through the prophets and, 
and uh, men and women of God down through the years. You see, there's nothing new under the sun. It's real easy to learn the Word of God because it never changes. But man will change it for you if you're not careful. Do you understand what makes it would seem the Word of God confusing to many people? It's man. Man, you know, just like I'll give you an analogy that God will use himself more than once and has used more than once through the Word of God. You can have clear water in, in a, pond, a pool, a pool of clear water. And he said the old goats can get in there and kick around and they'd stir up the mud and you just got a mess instead of pure water. That's the way the Word of God is. If you'll just stick with the pure water, the living water, and not let some goat go in and stir around and throw in a lot of his own traditions and cloud up the word until it doesn't make sense. And don't, don't feel bad because it doesn't make sense to you because it's so muddied, how could it? The traditions of men make void the true pasture of the living word. Therefore, the remnant is ever, ever important that you bring forth the that Word of God and share it with the family of God, not leaving anyone out that wants to participate, but to enjoy the Word, the food, the manna from heaven, the truth of God's Word, whereby you're not misled and whereby the swarmers cannot bother you and whereby you have the precious love of Almighty God. Let's go one more verse, please. Verse 4. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. He's going to do that. Again, it's God's elect that teach that word square on, without any side trips, whereby you can see the truth, know it, and understand it. Put it on, wear it, live it and let it lift you up, whereby you have nothing to fear because you know God has his wing over you and you are protected by that. How precious the word of God. We'll pick this up in the next lecture. Bless your hearts, don't miss it. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter, and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are, back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, if you have a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. Um, that's, we have, our father is the judge. Is, it's really, we're out of line when we judge. It's a great sin. So don't, don't be caught doing that. But do use spiritual discernment and stick with it. That, that is a gift from God to let you know when you hear truth and when you hear fiction. And that's, that's his gift to those that can, he can depend on. So let him know that you love him. Once you do that, if you have a question, share it. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now, you got a prayer request. You don't need the number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking 
Right now, he does. So uh, you don't even have to, you do not have to say it out loud. Just let him know you love him, talk to him. That's what prayer is. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. <clears throat> okay, we have um, uh, Marie from Texas. My question is, why did Judah and Israel come apart and are they together again? Please explain. Thank you. Uh, well, you're, you're very welcome. They are not together again. They came apart because uh, the Assyrian took the 10 northern tribes captive 200 years before the last two tribes were taken captive. They were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar 200 years later. So therefore, you have Ephraim many times is utilized by our father because he was the largest of those 10 tribes, meaning inclusive the 10 tribes, the 10 northern tribes. Those 10 northern tribes, as you've heard me say many times, went after they were cleared from the Assyrian, they went over the Caucasus Mountains, settled Europe, and later Canada and the Americas and various parts of the world. That's, that is the house of Israel. But the house of Judah was in um, uh, Babylon uh, for a period of time and then some returned. But if you're a good student of God's word, you know that even in those that returned, there were a lot of Nethanim that uh, returned with them. As a matter of fact, in the book of Ezra, half of the names that are given of, of Judah that returned to Israel, half of them are foreigners that were Nethanim, which means it, was, it means given to service. In other words, the priest got so lazy, is maybe started out they wouldn't cut wood for the fire. So they volunteered uh, uh, people in, uh, in, in around them to go out in Babylon to cut wood and so forth to do liturgical duties until finally the Nethanim took it over. They took over the priesthood. And so you want to be very, very careful. The, the, this is why it is written in Ezekiel chapter 37 in prophecy of what joins the two back together. <clears throat> Ezekiel is told to look in that valley and it, it was just a bunch of bones, spiritually dead. People don't know who they are, of which tribe. And he said, prophesy to them. That means preach to them. Preach the truth. What do you see now? Well, why? There's a, there's a few of them beginning to come to life out there. They're seeing the truth. They're hearing the word. Well, preach to them some more, God said. And one come on to another, and pretty soon a large group come together realizing who they were and what God's Word meant to them. And then to finalize this, which is future even to this point, he said, take a stick, take two sticks, write Israel on one, Judah on the other, and then put them together. So they will come back together as one unit, just as all people will come together through the Lord Jesus Christ to our Heavenly Father in the eternity. Nelson from Tennessee. Pastor Arnold, I just wanted to say what a blessing Shepherd's Chapel has been to me. I was surprised to learn that God loved me instead of wanting to destroy me. God bless you and your teachings. Well, thank you. That's, that's a nice comment. It is true. Father doesn't wake up every morning and want to zap somebody. He loves his children. It is his, in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, it is God's will that all people come to repentance. He's long-suffering. He's got lots of patience. They won't do it, but he's, he's, he's willing that they will. Uh, Valerie from Nevada, which of the Ten Commandments do you think is most hurtful? I think other than murder, it has to be envy and jealousy. That old spirit of jealousy is a terrible thing. It plays with your imagination, and it can really tear you up. Uh, it, the, what you want to do is anoint yourself and ask God to release you from 
if you happen to be in that um, uh, from the spirit of jealousy and get it done. Uh, Tina from Kentucky. I also have a question. Where is it written of that Jesus fast for 40 days and 40 nights? Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. It come time for him to be tempted of the devil. And he went into the wilderness. And he was uh, tempted 40 days and 40 nights. By what? This is what people need to really wake up because Christ wanted you to learn this lesson above all lessons, not all, but basically. And that is that Satan will tempt you with Scripture, which means from the pulpit. Satan can quote Scriptures more than, better than most Christians. There's just one problem. When you read Matthew 4, you notice he twists it just a little bit and it makes a lie out of God's Word. Naturally, Christ knew better. And he gives you the scriptures where you can check it out and see for yourself. Okay, this would be Marsha from Michigan. Thank you for your welcome. Uh, I get confused with the word Lord. Could you explain, is it Jesus Christ or Jehovah God? from Marsha from Michigan. Well, it's according, uh, it's according to what language you wish to say it in. In English, it is um, our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you wish to use the sacred names, which you hear me do many times, our Father's name is Yahweh. And uh, Jesus uh, in the Hebrew tongue is, is uh, Yeshua. And Yeshua it is. Uh, that being, if you wish to use the sacred names, and many people do. I use both because I'm a teacher, and I try to teach people to use the sacred name, especially in prayer, if you can grow accustomed to it. Lord's from Arizona. I'm 12 years old, and I would like to know, is it okay to anoint my dog if she is not well? Thank you. Well, of course you can. Sure you can. And... Uh, and for a 12-year-old wanting to do anointing, you go for it, okay? You take the olive oil and anoint uh, her and ask God to heal that pup, okay? And um, thank you for studying God's Word and believing our Father has the power to do that. You can read, and if, if, if somebody wants to have documented proof from the New Testament that you're doing properly, uh, Father says, uh, if you... Um, Use the oil of our people in James chapter 5. Call the elders, and if someone's even ill, or a house is ill, or people is ill, or even I will to go one step further, your animals are ill. Uh, I, as a farmer rancher, have, have uh, and even today, for, for natural wildlife, I pray that God will touch a deer, maybe even, and heal them. <clears throat> Lee from Kentucky. I've been married a long time. My husband is outgoing. He has a job now that he has to deal with the public all the time. Women are really friendly with him. I have a hard time with jealousy, so I am not happy. Is there something you can tell me to help me? Thank you, Lee from Kentucky. Well, just, just pray that the Father will release you from the spirit of jealousy. Now, if you had reason to be, that means uh, if you had seen something, then, then you might be concerned. If you haven't seen anything and it's all in your head, then you need to get rid of it. Okay. The spirit of jealousy is a very hurtful, harmful thing, and it is a spirit. You need to ask God to drive that spirit away in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and get rid of it. Um, you probably better be happy your husband has a job, okay, and is, has an income whereby he's feeding you. And, um, and I hope that he lets you know he loves you and that alleviates a lot of the anxiety. Nancy from Virginia, please explain what Jesus meant when he told the man the kingdom of God is within you. Thank you. Because of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God First, maybe we should define kingdom, and maybe that would make it easier for you to understand. 
kingdom is the king and his dominion. Inasmuch as our Father owns all things, and his spirit is the Holy Spirit, and he's promised you that that comforter will come and will come within you, then that kingdom then is within you at this present time with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Rob from Kansas, where can I find in the Bible that Eve was not the first woman? Well, chronologically, in chapter 1 of the great book of Genesis, he created male and female and told some of them to be hunters and some of them to be fishers and to replenish the earth. And they, in the Hebrew manuscripts, they are not eth ha-adam, which you will read of in the 8th chapter. They are the races of the world today. And then he rested the seventh day, and then he made the husbandman. That's the farmer, okay, with, with the intelligence to, and then he, after he created the husbandman, which is a farmer, he then created more animals for him to use domestically to work the land with and so forth. And he let Eth Adam even name those animals. And then he took DNA from that man, that's what the curve, which unfortunately is translated rib, but it's the helix curve of the DNA, formed Eve, and from that we have Christ ultimately. Uh, DeMarcus from um, uh, Michigan, how do we know if we are living life the way God wants us to? From the Word. Do my commandments, follow my advice, and it will be well with you. <clears throat> so all you have to do is follow, do what God wants you to do. And um, you might say, well, what is that? Well, just um, be, be natural and be a good citizen. And uh, basically, you'll be pleasing God then. But naturally, you learn by studying God's Word. That's why that you have teachers, and that's why that I dedicated my life to teaching, to simplify some of the places of God's Word that might be confusing to some whereby a child can understand. Whitney from Oklahoma, please explain Revelations chapter 3, verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. Who was he talking to? Church of Philadelphia, brotherly love. What, what was it about Philadelphia that Christ loved? He had nothing against that church. And why would he say, you've kept the patience of my word? Because they did. They knew who the, the, those that claimed to be of our brother Judah, but are the synagogue of Satan. Meaning you know who the Kenites are. And you keep God's word to stand against them. And he's going to keep you from the hour of temptation. Meaning when Satan comes and tempts the world, you're going to find him to be an abomination, not temptation. That's how you escape the hour of temptation. You, you might have some ignorant uh, person, and that's not, that's not a, an insult. It's just that if you don't know any better, you're ignorant. Okay, would say that's the flyaway doctrine. Okay, so That's how you escape. You escape temptation by flying away. That's not what it says. It says, because you kept my word, knowing who the Kenites are that claim to be our brother Judah <clears throat> and are the synagogue of Satan. That's what escapes the hour of temptation. Victoria from Montana. Is there a gap in the time between the end of this earth age and the beginning of the millennium? No, there is not. It happens instantly in the twinkle of an eye. We that remain and have not passed away will be changed into our spiritual bodies and the millennium is underway. Christ has returned and we get right to work. Doing what? Well, Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, we will be priests with Christ for a thousand years. What do priests do? You keep teaching. Uh, there's very little retirement for people that God chooses to lead and that's all of God's elect. They will be teaching. Brandon from Kentucky, is there any scripture that refers to the hell as a burning lake of fire? Oh, absolutely. 
We just mentioned it, really. I mentioned Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. Go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, and you will find that those that are not aligned with God will go into that lake, burning lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. And from Tennessee, what does the silver thread between you and God mean? Well, it's not between you and God. The silver thread is mentioned in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, and it's talking about this clay pot is your body. That's who it's talking about, the flesh body, that when it dies, when the clay pot breaks, in other words, your heart doesn't pump, you, you're not only clinically dead, you're biologically dead, meaning you're dead dead then at that instant, the silver cord parts. That silver cord is an imaginary thing that holds the spirit body in the flesh body. And when, when the flesh body dies, it instantly returns to the Father that gave it from whence it came, okay? Demarcus from Michigan, how can I get my family interested in God? Well, make it interesting for them. Tell them about Mark 13, where many are going to be delivered up before the false Christ that comes first, which you can, you can understand from the book of Revelation, he does come first. As a matter of fact, you can even find a real short uh, uh, biblical proof that the Antichrist comes first in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul says, I think my first letter might have messed you up, that a lot of people got the rapture doctrine out of it. I want to talk to you about our gathering back to Jesus Christ. It will not happen. And don't let that first letter deceive you, some angel, some spirit, or some man. It's not going to happen until after the son of perdition, that's Satan, as Antichrist, stands in the holy place claiming to be God. In other words, the great apostasy takes place. Deception. You're not going to be a part of it. You're going to escape that hour of temptation because you have the truth. Bill from North Carolina, um, when, when Satan rebelled against God, why didn't God destroy him at that moment? Why did he let him continue on like he has? Well, th there's, there's a lot more to it than that. It wasn't only that Satan rebelled, he, he drew a third of God's children away from God. Now, well, how serious is that? Well, we have half of the people living now that have lived since the time of Adam. And we've got about six billion plus, if an accurate account was made. That's 12 billion people. What is a third of 12? Four billion people followed Satan. I hope my math is right there. Four billion people followed Satan. Another four billion didn't give two hoots, and as long as they could just have a, you know, get along, and the, another four billion, just give me a job and let me get a buy and don't bother me with details, just like they are today. But there was a handful that's called God's elect that stood against Satan and that false teaching. Now, this puts God in a problem. What is he going to do? He can't destroy Satan. I mean, Satan was, he, see, he was God's child too. So he would have to destroy Satan and four billion of his children. He loves them. He didn't want to do that. So he brought forth the word of truth Instead, he destroyed the world age instead of Satan and those children and caused each entity to be born to woman independent to make his or her mind up to love God or Satan, your choice. And ultimately, those on their own will that choose Satan are going into the lake of fire, rightfully so. We don't want them with us, okay? And the rest are going to be happy eternally. In other words, God moved the monkey from his back and put it on each one of us individually, okay? But why? God loves his children. Doris, from, that's why he didn't destroy Satan, because Satan's still doing a fine job in finding out who's who. 
Doris from Virginia, are all sins the same or do they vary and is there an unforgivable sin? Sins do vary naturally. Sin is sin, but naturally, uh, uh, in, by the old law, the repayment for a sin had various um, amounts that you had to pay for breaking sin and so forth. You cripple a slave or something, it's 30 pieces of silver. But um, the unpardonable sin is for God's elect to not stand against the false Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them as it is written in Mark chapter 13. That's not going to happen. God's elect are ready. They're ready to uh, have the Holy Spirit use them. Dan from Nebraska, please explain the difference between the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Do both houses have 12 tribes and no, 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 no. There are only 12 tribes because of the 12 patriarchs. But 10 of the tribes went north by in 600 years before uh, Christ. They went into captivity by the Assyrian. He raided and naturally, why? well, why was it the 10 northern tribes? Because that's as far as he went. He left the two southern tribes. And then along comes Nebuchadnezzar and he takes the two southern tribes 200 years later and that split them up. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Makes his day. You're his child and he wants you to know the Word that he sends to you whereby you can be blessed and have him with you. It makes his day too. When you make his day, oh boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always, I do mean always, bless you. But there's one thing most important, and it's this. Listen closely. You stay in His Word every day. In His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.